I'd like to start the evening by introducing you to our dean, the new dean of the College of Public Service, Dr. Jonathan Schwartz. Thank you for coming out uh, on this Tuesday evening. Uh, I'm really proud of the amazing faculty of the college. It's a pleasure to be dean in a, in a college with faculty doing these amazing, amazing community engaged research. So uh, I'm really, it'll be a pleasure to hear them. They speak for themselves. Uh, it's going to be excellent. So thank you all for coming. And we have an honorary, Jerry Johnson is in our audience, who I'm sure helped fund this research. Do you want to stand up real quick? So thank you for coming to support. Uh, and without further ado, uh, go to the, and, yeah. And I would like to ask you all, don't be such a, don't be so shy. Move up forward so we can have a more relaxed, move up a little bit. Come on. Get a little closer. They don't bite. They look a little intimidating. They don't bite. Um, okay. Those of you who can, move up close so we can have a I was nice wondering what the schedule is. Oh, living room, atmosphere. <laughs> How am I really good at this? I don't know what I'm and, doing. Um, I'd like to start. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to start the evening by recognizing one of our faculty who's sitting in the audience, who today is, is a very big birthday. So. Uh, <laughs> This is Dr. Bernardo Pohl, who, who's celebrating a milestone birthday that I, I passed several years ago, but he is celebrating it just now, so happy birthday, Dr. Pohl. All right. Yes, happy 21st. There you go. So I am going to start this presentation by passing the microphone to Dr. Dawn McCarty. And Dr. McCarty is going to uh, talk to you about her, her research and her work and her book. And as she's speaking, I'm going to be passing out a, 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 a one-pager for each. As each person begins to speak, I'll pass out a one-pager on each person's work so that you could have something to take away with you. Dr. McCarty. All right. Thanks. <laughs> well, I'm very honored to be here with my esteemed colleagues and to talk about my work. Nothing more that academics like to do <laughs> than talk about our work. So thank you for coming and thank you for listening. Go Astros. Okay. So my name is Dawn McCarty and I'm the director of the social work program here at the University of Houston downtown. I, along with Joe Bailey, another faculty member, started this program and we came in 2007 so we're kind of new but not really and so I'm very invested and very proud of my faculty staff and students who are the best and so yes thank you we love you so I want to talk a bit about my work and my leave and so I was so grateful to get a developmental leave last year which you it's such a great opportunity to take a whole semester off and do work on a project or or for me it was to work on a book to talk about my service work and some of my research in mexico and then my service in mexico so let me and here in houston with new immigrants and um, asylum seekers and refugees so I'm really tired, so you'll have to forgive me. I have a squishy brain. <laughs> and I'm tired because every Tuesday, I'm up at 5 a.m. and I run a very large food distribution at Casa Juan Diego. We have about, our numbers are very up right now. So this morning we had 420 people come for food in the span of three and a half hours. And so I've interacted with literally many of those people and talked to many of them and connected with many of them. So I'm, so my brain, again, as I said, is a little squishy. <laughs> um, so that's part of the work that I do at Casa Juan Diego. So Casa Juan Diego, who knows about what happens there? Yeah, my students. <laughs> and so Casa Juan Diego is a center for new immigrants. And we have been in operation for since 1981. And we have health clinics and two health clinics. We do food distributions, other types of distributions, and we house and shelter people who are homeless, who are new immigrants to the country, or they are in the process of seeking asylum, or they're refugees from some um, refugee sending um, country. So I 
not only work there and do service work there, but also live there. Casa Juan Diego is an intentional community. It's a house of hospitality, a Catholic worker house. And part of the, the philosophy of the house is that you live in community with the people that you serve. And it's very intentional. And you live, take on this responsibility and this role voluntarily. And some, some traditions call it voluntary poverty. So I'm not poor, am I? No, <laughs> but I take on as much as possible of that, live in the same conditions, eat the same food and serve. And what I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is a new practice theory that I have developed called Solidarity Social Work Practice. So we do something very different at Casa Juan Diego and I feel so, Stephen's given me the no one can hear me sign. So grateful for this opportunity and the work that I've been able to do and the service that I've been able to provide. So that's just a little bit of the work of Casa Juan Diego. So people come from all over the world and I'm a social worker, so I provide social work services. And, and or maybe I clean the bathroom or maybe I help cook lunch. So it's a community and we live in community and we do the work that's necessary and um, all of it. So it's a very different experience. So I started, I got involved and interested in uh, Casa Juan Diego because I spent many years doing research in Mexico. So I spent all together in large groups of time over two years in central Mexico and southern Mexico, spending um, traveling the country, interviewing families, and spending time in communities, and learning about what was happening in, this, in 2006, 2005, and during that time period was really the last very large out-migration, particularly from Central Mexico to the United States, and whole communities were decimated. Whole communities had lost every able-bodied person, and the only people that were left trying to keep the community going were um, women and other uh, and older people. So communities had been completely um, so, sort of abandoned in, in many ways. So at the time in the U.S., we were talking about immigration. When we talk about immigration, do we t what's our sort of tendency in the United States? Whose perspective are we talking about? <laughs> Yes, we're, we're worried about us, right? How does immigration affect us? How, what happens in the United States? Well, I was interested in what happens in Mexico at that particular time, in other countries, sending countries. So this is a type of research called um, Left Behind. And P there are other countries, uh, there's other research in countries, but not really much in Mexico about what happens to families left behind in the migration process. So that's why I started the project, out of sort of sheer curiosity, wondering, what was, um, you know, what the experience was like for people in sending communities. So, so I, I had my very first developmental leave, <laughs> so hard, which was, which funded that project, that initial seven months of research in Mexico. So here I am again, back in Houston, trying to um, make sense of all, all of my work, spending time in understanding what's happening in sending countries, and then in Houston, understanding and learning about what happens to the actual migrant. And so when I decided that it was time to try and pull that together, I made, wrote the proposal to write the book. So the book, I think, is you'll see on your handout follows the stories of seven, seven people. There, there are many other stories, but I'm really following the story of seven migrant persons and learning about their experience from their migration story until the present, and sometimes that covers decades. So I've known, I've known some of the people in the book for quite some time and spent much time with them in service to them. So I've strategically picked folks in the book. There's uh, talk about human trafficking from the perspective of, of a guest at Casa Juan Diego. I talk about all the issues you hear about in, in the news from the perspective of people that I've served and the perspective of people who've survived and continue to survive. So I'm very proud of, of the project. I'm proud of the work. I'm proud of people who really teach me every day about really what I'm supposed to be doing as a social worker. I'm not really teaching them, right? They're teaching me about, about um, kindness and, and, 
and va the values of social work, like the importance of human relationships and all those important things that we're trying to teach students about social justice and what that means. So I'll talk just for a minute about my, my new practice philosophy, solidarity social work practice. So in a profession, we spend a lot of time, I feel, and um, some other folks in formalized professions can talk about this, just sort of setting ourselves apart, right? We are the professional. We are the person with degrees. We are the person with the knowledge. And at Casa Juan Diego, that sort of gets broken down intentionally. You, you may come to that relationship with knowledge and education and privilege and degrees, but there's a way to, 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 to change the dynamic. And that, so at Casa Juan Diego, we really, we don't see ourselves as a distant and separate, separate person from the people that we're serving, we work very intentionally and voluntarily to minimize the distance between us. So that's why we live in community. That's why we, we, we serve and we live and we work the way that we do. Because something very powerful happens when you take a relationship that's unequal, right? Because here, here's a, here's a professional and here's a person in need, a person that you're tasked to help then what happens in that relationship is disempowering. So, so what we do is purposefully and voluntarily say to this other person that I am here with you, I am in solidarity with you, and that process opens a door to healing, to empowerment, to for not just the person that you're serving, but also for you in a way that doesn't happen as a professional. So I talk about that. It doesn't happen in that distant, I'm more important than you relationship, which is really turns out to be just one more experience of oppression for a person, right? So I, I spend a lot of the book talking about stories of people, but also about how solidarity heals and helps people move forward in these very, very difficult times for new immigrants in this country. So I think I had really just one more thing to close with. If you know, solidarity means um, sort of in, in every day, not just saying that you are with another person or that you are alongside another person. But it really is in, in all reality, particularly for people who are working with the new immigrants, for us at Casa Juan Diego, is that you, when you say, you say to another person that if they come for you, then they come for me. And there is nothing more powerful in our human condition and our human experience there's nothing more, more value creating in a relationship. It's nothing that shares more value to another person than when you say that to them. That you are so important and so valued that if they come for you, they come for me. So that's what we do. And I'm just quite honored. And some of you have volunteered with me at Casa Juan Diego, so I invite you. To, to come spend time with our students this morning, uh, giving out food. And I'm happy to answer any questions about the work in Casa Juan Diego or the, my um, previous work in Mexico. I know there's some students interested in um, some study abroad opportunities there I'd like to, I can help you with. And then, um, and would be happy to answer more questions. And don't buy my book. I will give you a copy. <laughs> it's too expensive. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McCarty. <gasps> Uh-oh. Now I would like to pass, where is she? Here she is. I would like to pass the microphone to Dr. Lovins. I know. So um, Dr. Lovins, here you go, and I will pass out your sheet. Okay, great. 
Hello. Again, thank you all for being here. I know that uh, it's a tough decision between an Astros game and a UHD event. So, but it hasn't started yet, right? So we, we should be good. So, um, man, that's kind of a hard act to follow, right? Mine is, does not show the same dedication for sure. But, um, but I wanna talk a little bit, I'm a criminal justice professor, uh, an assistant professor here at UHD. I've been here about five years. And I'm gonna talk about a project that I worked on um, my second year in the program, I applied for an ORCA grant. Thank you to Jerry Johnson. I was um, given an award to, uh, to be able to work on that grant um, and was very happy to involve a student as well. Um, that student worked um, as an independent study student on the project. And so I'm just gonna talk a little bit about that project and kind of what, you know, what happened as a result and what we found with the, with the project. So, this was a project that looked at an intervention that was new to Harris County um, in terms of their court dockets. So the idea with this intervention, the, the county actually received a very large grant to tackle the problem of, um, of mass incarceration and specifically jail incarceration. So anyone familiar, do I have CJ students in the room? Raise your hand if you're a CJ student. Oh, not a single hand, oh no, one, one brave soul. Two, two, okay. So we have a couple of CJ uh, students. So is uh, overpopulation of prisons and jails a problem? Yes, right, even if you're not a CJ student, you know that, right? Um, so what this project, they received funding from the MacArthur Foundation. And the idea was um, to look at strategies that help reduce jail populations. And what we did with our ORCA grant is look at the effectiveness of just one piece of this larger grant. Um, and so we were given access to resources to be able to do that, access to the data to be able to look at it. So what this, uh, this initiative was, was a specialized docket in the court. Now, Harris County is a huge county, as you know. They actually have 38 different distinct courts. So what this project did is it looked at people who engaged in kind of low level offenses with the idea of running them through this specialized docket. So there are offenses like marijuana possession that if anyone's heard the DA talk, right? DA comes here quite a bit to talk about some of her initiatives. Um, you know that there are already diversion effort, efforts to really low level crimes like marijuana where really they're getting them in and out of the system as quickly as possible. This initiative dealt more with kind of in-between crimes. So there were two specific uh, target populations. One was individuals in possession of a controlled substance that was less than one gram. It's a felony possession charge. So not the lowest level, right, drug crime, but not the highest either. So felony level possession of any controlled substance, not just marijuana, but less than a gram. So that was one of the target populations. The second was third prostitution, which also bumps a prostitution offense up to felony level. So if anyone knows sort of anything about CJ, right, misdemeanor level crimes, they're not gonna end up in prison for that. Felony level, now you have the option of sentencing a person to prison. So what was happening in the court was that um, because the churning process of looking at cases took a long time, for these lower level offenses, what would often happen is someone would get arrested, they would go to jail, and just the time to process the case, if they didn't get bonded out, they would be sitting in jail for six, nine months maybe. And so by the time their case got to the judge, judge would often give time served, right? And then they would go where? Back out into the community again. Now, by the time I have a felony level drug charge, a third prostitution, these are typically people that have some needs, right? People that have drug or alcohol problems, people that are justice involved. In fact, in our data, about 20%, it was their sixth or more felony level offenses. So these aren't all just first time offenders, right? So they are people that definitely have needs. And what we know in the criminal justice system is just spending some time in jail and getting out doesn't typically result in you being able to correct your behavior, right? Deterrence theory, not so much data to support it. So it doesn't deter people from engaging in more crime. So these were people that were cycling right back into the system, right? So what this initiative did is created a specialized docket. Now, has anyone heard of a drug court before? Okay. 
So drug courts are typically courts that are designed to treat drug offenders, but they're designed to be more intensive than what a drug offender would get on a regular docket, right? So the judge is involved with the case, the person's involved with treatment, the dockets are much smaller, they're seeing fewer cases. This docket was not a specialty docket, it was almost the opposite. It was designed to process many, many, many more cases than a typical docket does. So what they did is anyone arrested for a third prostitution or this possession of a controlled substance less than a gram, they all came to one docket. And God loved the judge who ran this docket, right? He was seeing lots of cases. But the idea was that they would see the judge within 24 hours, and the defendant would agree or not agree to participate in the docket. So every case that went through the docket became a plea, and that person agreed to a term of community supervision, as opposed to kind of taking their chances with the regular docket, which could result in a prison stay, could result in more jail time, right? Because here's what would happen. By the time someone served five, six months in jail, and then maybe they were given a little additional time, they said, I'll do my extra three months and go home. They weren't pleading to a term of community supervision. But community supervision was really their avenue to getting treatment. So that's where they could get access to substance abuse treatment, residential level treatment. And so a lot of these folks were just missing out on any kind of intervention. So the initiative looked at, let's get these people in a docket seen as quickly as possible. The other piece is we have to assess them right, or, right away. So by the time the judge sees them, right, we know what needs to happen with their case. We know that they will go on to probation and that if they need a residential level of care or if they'll be seen in the community, we know kind of what they need. So we identified needs and then saw the cases. Um, and so what the research study, and this is where ORCA comes into play, what the research study looked at is was this intervention effective at decreasing jail days? So were the people, and what we did is looked at a period before implementation of this specialized docket, and then a period of time after implementation, six months on both ends, just to really look at was the docket effective at decreasing jail days? So processing the cases quickly, did that work to get people out of jail more quickly? And what we found is definitely a significant reduction in jail days based on the implementation of the docket. So it definitely met that objective of, yes, we can, if we see cases quickly, give them options for community supervision, decrease the amount of time they're spending in jail. And that made some sense just based on the quicker processing of the cases. We also looked at a couple of other interesting questions. So we also wanted to know, did people who took the terms of community supervision recidivate at lower rates than the people who did not, right? Because in the criminal justice field, that tends to be the end goal. That's always the outcome we're looking at, who's engaging in future crime, who is not. And what we found is that when we compared cases that went in before and after, right, we didn't really see differences in recidivism rate, right? And part of that may have been that on community supervision, if they weren't doing well, they're gonna get bounced back to the court. So we didn't see the differences in recidivism that we were hoping to see. However, one other comparison we did is we looked at, at the defendants who said, yes, I will plea and stay on the specialized docket versus those who said, no, thank you, I will take my chances, assign me to a regular docket as I normally would have been. And when we compared those cases, the defendants who went to regular dockets recidivated at higher rates than those who stayed on the specialized dockets and got some kind of intervention. So we did see some, some effect in terms of that. Um, so those were some things. The other thing we found that with the reduced jail days, not only we looked at this by race, and we found that not only did we see a significant redu a reduction in jail days after the specialized docket went into play, we also saw that that significantly impacted minority defendants. So there was more impact on minority defendants in terms of the reductions than white defendants. So that was another good thing because the larger initiative looked not only at jail days, but how that disproportionately affected minority individuals in the community. So again, those are positive things we saw um, from this project. So I will talk a little bit about the involvement of the student. So the grant itself didn't actually, wasn't able to fund a student. So we kind of used other measures to get a student involved. I had a student who was really interested in research. And so I signed her up for a summer independent study. 
And so she was able to do a few things as part of that. Not only were we able to kind of look at the data together, um, I had a partner from Harris County CSCD who we worked together on. He was able to access the data. We were able to look at that and examine the data together. But what the student was able to do that I think was a really cool experience for her is she could go and observe the docket. So she went scheduled observation dates just to see the flow of the docket and how that looked and how it was different from other dockets. And then she also was able, she and I scheduled a time to interview the judge. So we were able to talk some about the initiative, get the judge's feedback on kind of what he saw that was working, what he saw that could be improved. And so she had kind of direct experience with the judge about how this project actually worked. So I think the nice thing about it is not only did it allow me to do research, not only did the research lead to presentations, um, I did a presentation at a national conference and if you are a student, there is a student research conference here at um, UHD. So the student was able to do a poster presentation at the student conference at, as well. And she now enrolled in the master's program, so that is great experience for her, right? And as an undergraduate, actually talking about the research she was involved in doing. So we were able to present the data, um, and then we're working on a publication for that now. So that is essentially, and I'm probably less than 15 minutes, but that's okay, because the Astros game starts at seven something, right? Um, so any questions at all? Any questions for Dr. Lovins? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, well, I don't need the mic. Okay, when you were speaking about the different types of um, dockets? Yes. Okay. Um, in reference to the docket where they could uh, like get, I guess, uh, not the jail time, but they would get like maybe treatment. Yes. Is this for the actual dealers or the ones, the substance users? Did they define at the time which was which? You, you get what yes. I'm trying to say? It's kind of. Yep. Because actually because of how they defined the criteria, because mm -hmm. they, they wanted to identify people who were possession of controlled substance less than a gram, that less than the gram really screened out the dealers, right? Okay. Because the okay. dealers were defined by having enough drugs to suggest they're selling. So they were really trying to identify, again, these kind of lower level offenders which more, with more drug problems and need for intervention than, yeah, than what a dealer might have, which so, might do more time. So what did they get? Did they get more like, um, like they would go to treatment or did they get, did they receive any kind of uh, probation? You mean the dealers or the No, no, users? no, 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 the actual people yeah. that got on the docket with that one judge where yes. they could like get the treatment and stuff. Yep, so part of the plea bargain was that you will be assessed by, um, Harris County Probation has an assessment unit. They have risk assessments, needs assessments. So the assessment really drives what level of intervention that person needs. So maybe if I'm a person with possession of cocaine, less than a gram, right? That could just be my first time. I don't have a significant drug history. I don't have a lot of risk factors. And maybe they would just suggest, you know, um, a, a supportive outpatient program. But I could have the same person with the same charge that has been using cocaine for 20 years and they picked up the same charge. That person might need a residential level of care, but it's the assessment that really drives what treatment they need. So they're both on community supervision, but the assessment will say kind of how much actual treatment might a person need based on what their needs are. And was that for uh, teenagers? Oh, sorry, well adults. adults. Nope, all adults. So now, in, in, of course, in our world, 17 and up is an adult um, here. But yeah, so it's an adult initiative. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great questions. Yeah. OK, let's pass it to you. Oh, sorry. The reason sorry. why we're using the microphone is because the session is being recorded, and it's also being live streamed to the Northwest campus. So that's why we need to speak into the microphone. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Um, I was wondering if part of the qualitative, qualitative data was on reasons why people would have chosen one or the other program. Yeah, we didn't do a lot of qualitative data. We were really looking more at outcomes, but that would be a really interesting study too and just looking at kind of asking questions. Here's one thing that they added to the this reintegration court is, which I think was a great idea, they added peer specialist. 
to the actual courtrooms, right? So that when defendants were coming up and deciding, do I want to kind of go this more community supervision treatment route versus take my chances, do my time, right? That the peer specialists were there to kind of support them and really encourage them to kind of go the treatment route. So that made a difference in defendants really looking at, you know, am I gonna do this? The other thing is they had the same defense attorney, prosecutor, judge, so like specialty courts, they had the same body of kind of court personnel running it that also helped with just the flow in all of those cases, yeah. But yeah, qualitatively, it'd be nice to look at where those decisions lie. And I will say, right, a lot of people opt out of community supervision, why? The, the stigma, it's also like you've got a lot of conditions to follow. So they worry this case is just going to turn into technical violations, more time, people, me having to, you know, report to a probation, all the things that come along with it. So taking time is often easier, even though people are spending time in jail and prison, than doing terms of community supervision. So there was some convincing. The other really pivotal role with this was the judge. And the judge, right, who typically is just there to like sentence, right, and, and, and look at guilt, the judge really encouraging people to go, you know, the treatment, the supportive route versus just taking time. Was there any quantitative data outcomes in regards to financial relief to either the client or the system? No, we did not look at money, but I'm guessing the larger MacArthur Foundation, as they look at all the initiatives together, will definitely look at cost savings. And I can tell you, jail days, prison days, that's where a lot of the money comes into play. It costs far more than paying for treatment and probation officers and anything you do on a community level. So yes, my guess is just seeing the reduced jail days is going to equate to, you know, financial benefit for the county. So, and then that kind of pays for itself, right? So, yeah. Interestingly, the judge who runs the docket got voted out, right? When the kind of blue sweep happened the last election, but fantastic judge. This is why I don't go all like one ticket, depending on judges, um, they pulled him back in to run this docket, right? He ran the mental health docket before, so they were able to pull him back in to run this one as well. So that made a big difference just in who you put in that spot uh, for these kind of courts. Sorry, and there's one other question. Jeez, um, now I put you on the spot. I know, right? Do you forget there's another one back there? Three, two. Okay, so um, as someone who's kind of familiar with at least Star Court, and I'm knowing many people have gone through that, you say these dockets are streamlined to have a, a higher caseload to move through quickly. With the uh, with those who reoffended while under community supervision, were they sent back into that docket, and wouldn't that overload uh, the judge's caseload? That is a great question. Um, yes, that same judge, so once you assigned, were assigned to the Rick docket, yes, he maintained those. But unlike a specialty court where really that judge is seeing that, that defendant, right, every week, every two weeks, once a month maybe, if they're really at the end, um, probation would handle most of the, they're not kind of meeting the terms, they would only bounce them back if there were significant issues. And because it was one judge, they, he would also staff the cases sometimes without pulling the defendant back about what to do about certain defendants. So yeah, because you're right, that will. A lot of the cases were new, but he did see some of the ones that he needed to see again. Yeah, yep. All right, very good. Yes? Um, just looking at the decision making for them choosing to take this program over the jail time, mm -hmm. you said that it was felony, like felony cases. Yeah, they're all felony, yep. Part of the plea deal include like a deferred action once they finish the community supervision or like taking a lesser plea for a misdemeanor and then continuing with this? They all, I believe, that's a great question. I believe that, oh my gosh, and don't take my word for this. I believe though that part of the condition was if they completed Rick that they dropped the charges so that they did not have these charges so long as they successfully completed the intervention. And don't take my word on that, but I'm pretty sure that that is true. Yeah, is part of that. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you, Dr. Lovins. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. So um, what I didn't get a chance to say before was what I love about these, these sessions is that you get to see the breadth and depth of the work that is being done here in the College of Public Service. 
uh, from immigration to work with the courts, to work in the schools, uh, to things that touch us all, each and every one of us in every aspect of our lives. These professionals, these are, they are working on these every day. So um, I want to pass the uh, baton to Dr. Perez. Thank you. All right. She's going to open up. You want me to do it? Hi, everyone. I'm going to try to hold all these things at the same time. Um, so uh, my presentation, um, I gave it a little title, Second Generation Narrative of Identity, Language, Literacy, and Culture. And um, this is um, really a presentation that I was able to do this summer in Soria, Spain, um, for the Fifth International Colloquium on Identity, Language, and Culture. Um, thanks to the sponsorship of um, the university with the faculty development grant. So that's what I'm going to speak with you guys about tonight. And I, I had applied for that conference and for the grant so that I could continue writing and thinking about my research in different ways. And as a result of that, I was able to finish a chapter that I was writing um, for a book that actually was just released today, I found out, for a rootless press. So, yeah. <clears throat> so it's no surprise to anyone here that um, there are a lot of immigrants in American society, right? Houston being a very diverse city as well. Um, about one out of four children in the U.S. live in immigrant households. Um, out of the Latino population, 47% of these, and this number you know, just increases over time, are U.S.-born Latinos, which means that the fastest growing segment are second and third generation um, children of immigrants that who still hold on to um, perhaps multiple languages and hybrid uh, identities as well. Is anyone sitting here in the audience who considers themselves uh, in this category? All right. And um, m for many of the children of immigrants, English is actually their dominant language, contrary to what many might think. So. My parents were amongst the first wave of Cuban immigrants um, in the early 60s to leave Cuba uh, after the country's uh, revolution and subsequent turn to communism. Um, and this is where I think my story begins, with them leaving Cuba and um, later on meeting in, in New York and getting married and having me. Um, so part of this research is, is autobiographical. It's my own story. And I use a narrative inquiry methodology. Um, I explore stories as a way of knowing and making sense of a phenomenon. And I, and I started by looking back on my own life as a bilingual um, person to try to make sense of the things that we take for granted in life. Um, and this involves cycles of reading and thinking and writing over time. And the research question that I was trying to answer was, how did my own literacy and language growth develop across the context of my life and in relation to my identity as Cuban American? And the finding that I'm going to focus on today is um, something that I was really had never thought of in my life, but the finding that religious faith practices contributed in a very big way to the development of bilingualism, bilingualism and biliteracy for me. Um, so part of the frameworks that uh, undergird this work is a view of literacy as not just reading and writing and not something that we just do in our head, but something that is so sociocultural. It's social, it um, has everything to do with our culture, and it builds on our oral language. Um, and also sociolinguistic understandings of language as part of a larger landscape of communication and something that we do in the world and not just something that we have in our head. So language and literacy are actions that we, um, that we do things with in our lives. And I'll show you more examples as we move forward. And uh, um, continuing this train of thought, literacy in the 21st century it has really exploded and our understanding of literacy as well. Um, we talk about multi-literacies because we don't just do one thing. We might um, be literate in multiple languages. We might read in several languages. We might um, speak in meshing languages as we do that. We practice in digital domains um, and across domains of practice, at church, at home, in the community, in different spaces. And we also engage in multimodal literacies. Um, we use gestures to communicate. We use the visual, musical, digital, 
and you know whatever you can think of really and we use all of this together as part of our literacy repertoire um, and so to look at the spaces of Catholic worship because that was the faith that I was born into um, Catholicism is very multimodal and has many different texts that people draw from for example um, during Mass, we read from a Missalette, which is a book that has the readings that, you know, are going to be prominent every Sunday, and also different prayers. Um, we have psalm books. We have prayers and novenas, which are dedicated to the saints. There's a lot of singing, as there is, you know, across many faith practices. Um, if you've ever been to a Catholic Mass, you know that there's chanting, there's recitation, some things that you say by memory, other things that you read. There's also a choral nature to it as the community responds together. So in a way, everyone supports each other. If you forget a word, everybody's saying that word, so you're carried along. Um, but there are also moments of silent prayer where you're saying these prayers in your head. Um, or you're listening, and you're listening to cues because you know that after that cue is when you kneel, or when you stand, or when you say that prayer. Um, and then every artifact carries a story, from the stained glass windows to the statues of the saints. Um, there's a story surrounding every artifact of the church, and including uh, the iconography. Uh, I included, one of the saints that I included is St. Anthony, because my grandmother always used to have a little um, St. Anthony on any of her chiffre robes wherever she lived. And Anthony was my, Antonio was my grandfather's name, so she had a special devotion. Um, to that saint. So Catholic literacies are also intensely multimodal. They're oral through singing and chanting and responding to prayer. They're tactile when we hold rosary beads and we say a prayer as we go bead by bead or when we say the sign of the cross and we gesture with our bodies or when we dip our fingers into the holy water and there's a prayer that is said with all these things. It's also very visual and very artifactual with all, all the stuff of Catholicism that reminds you of it. Um, so I inherited this legacy of Catholic literacies as my mother uh, left Cuba. This is actually her, not her original prayer book because she wasn't able to take anything out of Cuba, but um, through one of her classmates many years later, this is an actual prayer book that they, she used to use in her school. It's in Spanish and it has some of the mysteries of the rosary, something that I would la later learn. And that's a, um, a little estampita. Of, of the Virgin Mary. So my mother's journey when she left Cuba was to go to Spain because that was the first place they went because my grandfather was a Spaniard and trying to find as refugees a better life. But that didn't work out because things were tough in Spain so they had to come back and go uh, to New York like many immigrants do and that's where she met and married my father and that's where I was born. Um, so in the context of my life in New Jersey, and this was a small American town, this wasn't the city uh, where a lot of immigrants mixed, um, we were really the only Spanish speakers. So Spanish was the language of the home and the oral language that surrounded me as I grew up. And aside from other things, a big part of that was through the practice of our faith, which was not just going to church, but other things that you also do at home. Saying nightly prayers like el angel de mi guarda, dulce compañía, um, attending family baptisms, as my aunts were scattered across different states, but when we got together, we celebrated these things. Um, and this is how our Cuban and Catholic identity was passed on to the second generation. And so much so, my Spanish was, I knew that it was in the home and it was associated with these Catholic practices, so I kind of grew up believing that to be Cuban was to be Catholic because I really had never been to Cuba. So my idea of what it was to be Cuban were these things and these stories and these practices that I saw in the home. Um, until the, and then eventually we started um, a Catholic school ourselves when I was in the first grade. And uh, one more thing about Catholicism is that um, Catholicism is in universal faith. Everywhere you go in the world, you're gonna see the mass celebrated the same way, even if it's in a different language. Um, but even before, you know, in the United States, before I was able to go to Mass in English, for my mother, going to church, it was in Latin. So she grew up with the Latin Mass, still looking and practicing Catholicism in two languages, in a way. So these are some more artifacts of Catholic um, faith, and I call them here texts because they tell a story. This is a baptismal gown with the gloves and the prayer book and the, and the saint cards. 
Um, here's a saint card that would be printed as a, as a remembrance of a First Communion. So when I started, uh, oh, sorry, when I started Catholic school in New Jersey, all of a sudden what I knew in an oral way and in Spanish became now formalized into an academic literacy. Since I was going to school and learning these things, I started learning, of course, how to read and write in school. And part of that was religion class and reading and writing about the faith and uh, going to mass in, in English in more uh, formal ways. So what I already had started learning in Spanish was now all of a sudden mapped on to an English and developed in a different way. So I believe that um, the oral literacies of the home funneled into the academic literacies of school, which resulted in not only me learning to read in English, but eventually being able to one day discover that, oops, I could read in Spanish. As I was sitting in a Spanish mass and my mother said, you can read that, and, I, and somehow I did, because literacy transfers that way. Right? So there was a reciprocity between the language and literacies of the home and the school that continued to build on each other. Although just because I could read in Spanish does not mean that I did, because I really did not. My dominant language, as for many kids in the US, became English because that was the language of the culture and of the school and the language that I would use the most. So Spanish was the language of the home, of abuelitos, of the cousins, these early Catholic practices, of food, of course, um, and all of you know, childhood songs and other fairy tales and things that I would hear from my grandmother and my mother. Um, Spanish to me signaled Cubanidad and um, the Catholic faith practices also signaled this and that's who I was in New Jersey. However, what happened here? Oh, um, I also had my English language which was the language of popular culture or school of academic literacy and of Catholic academic literacy and that um, kind of funneled into my American identity and I was fine with that but then we moved to South Florida and my life was turned on its head because all of a sudden things were very different in Miami Florida in 1979 1980 um, this is where really the majority of Cubans had settled after leaving uh, Cuba and by this time um, it had become, well, the largest um, amount of Cuban people in America to this day continues to be Miami. And so everywhere you went in Miami, you saw uh, symbols and artifacts of Cubanidad. In fact, before I was used to Spanish just being spoken in my home, and now sp Spanish was spoken everywhere in the community. And Miami is very atypical. This is, you know, it has a very different history because the Cubans in Miami were a powerful minority. So it, Spanish really dominated and permeated all of these spaces in a way that was very open, but also in a way that made it very difficult for me um, to communicate because I was used to the simple Spanish that I used with my grandmother, little things about food and, and whatnot, and here strangers were talking to me in Spanish. So it was hard for me to answer them. So the linguistic ecology of Miami was very different. Um, there was a lot of bilingualism, um, translating. People would go back and forth between languages very easily. Um, and there was also a lot of diversity. Um, the Cubans continued to leave Miami throughout the years, um, but they had different experiences. They had different experiences politically, uh, nationally, um, depending on when they had left Cuba. And uh, my move to uh, Miami coincided with the largest, um, with the Mariel boat lift. I don't know if anybody is old enough to remember that. Um, but it was really a historical phenomenon and a couple hundred thousand Cubans were able to leave. And so it really changed the, the landscape there. But there was also an influx of Venezuelans and Nicaraguans and Argentinians and Colombians, you know, all immigrating to Miami. So it was a very diverse space. Those of you who are Hispanic knows that there's not one Hispanic, right? There's different nationalities, ethnicities, races. The Spanish, although it was Spanish, and we do share that in common, they have a different cadence, different words. and um, especially for me, since I had not been born in Cuba, it made it difficult for me sometimes to understand, you know, what people were um, communicating. So a lot of nuance um, here. And eventually I learned, well, not all Cubans are Catholic, first of all. And I, I started developing also a sense of self of my Cubanness compared to others. 
um, because other people had different experiences of being Cuban, especially if they had actually been born on the island. Um, so in this very super diverse space, my mother one day dropped me and my sister off at a youth group and just pushed us along and said, and um, she actually, she did this because really they couldn't afford to continue uh, paying for a Catholic school and she wanted us to continue having faith formation like she had had in Cuba. So she dropped us off in this youth group, but this youth group was in Spanish. It was the church's response to the surge of immigration in Miami and it was really very different from anything I had experienced because all of a sudden um, we were asked to contribute in Spanish and read texts in Spanish that I really hadn't had access to, like the Bible. <laughs> I could read the Bible in English, but to read it in Spanish is quite a different matter because that language is archaic and, and complex. Um, and also, it wasn't the chanting and the communal support of the mass, but actually just talking about our faith or responding to a scripture reading. So that type of organic conversation at that high level was, was something that was difficult. Um, also singing um, and doing these things. But I rose to the occasion because I wanted to be there with all these teenagers who were fascinating. And so I would bring my English Bible and I would try in my choppy Spanish and going back and forth to participate. So some of the religious literacy practices that took place in youth group were, of course, weekly mass, um, Bible readings. I would type up song sheets because I was in the choir. Um, I picked up the guitar from one of my Nicaraguan friends, so I would practice songs on the guitar, and because she was Nicaraguan and recently arrived, these were all in Spanish. Um, using the missalette in Spanish, and just interacting with the saint cards and rosaries and prayer books in Spanish as well. Um, the musical literacy played a really big role, because some of the words, and I have an example here, based on the poetry of uh, Santa Teresa de Avila, which is really archaic Spanish. Vuestra soy para vos nací. Kind of like if you're thinking of Shakespearean English type of thing. Um, and here's another one uh, from Antonio Machado, who happens to be from Soria, Spain. Um, and then here's another one uh, from Santa Teresa to show how metaphorical the language is and the translation in English is the divine prison of love in which I live has freed my heart and made captive my God. So by practicing these songs and playing them in the guitar and typing up the song sheets, I was actually engaged in writing at high levels of Spanish and introduced to this vocabulary and diction that I had not been um, exposed to before and I really had had no reason to interact with before. Um, an, another aspect of writing emerged through the writing of palancas, which is a practice um, which we engaged in when we went to retreats and wrote letter, letters of encouragement to each other. And our relationships crossed over when we discovered that some of us attended the same school, uh, which was interesting because we would have never met in school. We were in different classes. A lot of them were in ELL classes and I was like in honors English. But once we discovered that we were in the same school, we would look, seek each other out during lunch and sit together and our bilingual conversations would continue there. Um, so the the translanguaging spaces of youth group um, offered a flexibility of language use where you could speak in Spanish, you could speak in English, you could mix it, and nobody was going to judge you. You know, they were learning English, I was learning more advanced Spanish, and we kind of supported each other over time, and we both developed our languages over time. Um, proficiency was not the goal, but communication was. And this is very different from what usually happens in school, right? Where we're being graded and assessed every time we do something. But because there was that flexible language, this provided a bridge between those of us who were more novice speakers and those who were more expert spe speakers. Um, and we made meaning together. Um, and over time, it helped me become biliterate. So that eventually, after a couple of years, I could stand up in front of a crowd, and I'm not saying my Spanish is perfect, but I could speak um, or give witness or even translate if someone is speaking in English and do the Spanish translation or do a reading in a Catholic mass in Spanish or write in Spanish, even though I'm gonna make some mistakes and I'm gonna leave out a bunch of accents, but um, I'm able to do it at a level that I was never able to do it before. 
Um, so, and just to define trans languages, translanguaging because it is an important concept, what it means is, is that shuttling between languages that bilinguals do, especially when we're talking to other bilinguals. And some of you know it as code switching or Spanglish, but the difference is that the, the theory of translanguaging posits that we're not really two different people with two different divided between an English and a Spanish, but our language is one system. So it's natural to flow when you're bilingual between languages. And you just do it because you know in certain spaces people are gonna understand you. So just another little figure to show how the Spanish oral literacies, English academic literacies, bilingual religious literacies, um, all resulted in biliteracy because of this ease of translanguaging um, throughout. And that might resonate with some of you who are bilingual who may have had some experiences, maybe not at church, but at other spaces. So as far as identity, in Miami, I you know, developed a, a sense of being Cuban-American, to have the best of both worlds, right? I was born in the US, so I felt American. Um, and I had my academic language uh, of English, but I also had my uniquely Cuban culture, and now I understood what that was in relation to um, the pan-ethnic um, friends around me. Um, and so it, it was almost like a mirror, you know, experiencing life with other people and even other um, teenagers who were from Cuba, maybe my age, but had been raised in Cuba, and it helped me understand myself in relation to them. Um, so at the end of the day, we know that language, identity, culture, and literacy are nested phenomenon, and I think that my story really helped me understand that um, in a deeper way. And some of the insights that I walk away with are that Adolescents do engage in sophisticated literacies and by literacy building through religious practice. We don't often think of religion as a space where we're learning and we're building literacy. Also that there is a reciprocity between the literacies of the home, school, and community that teachers can build upon in the teaching of literacy. Um, also that multimodal literacies and translanguaging offered a web of support for developing bilingualism and biliteracy. And lastly, that through their religious literacies, especially immigrant students, um, they, it is possible to become a little bit more cosmopolitan. One researcher calls it cosmopolitan intellectuals because there's a wealth of knowledge that immigrant kids or kids from immigrant families, knowledge about the world that they bring with them that other kids just don't have just by virtue of who they are. So I'd like to acknowledge again um, the UHD Faculty Development Grant and other support that I received before um, that helped me complete this work. And I don't know if you have any questions or if we have time. You yeah, look. absolutely. Do you, anyone have any, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Perez? Yes. Yes. I there was one sure slide how. you sped through a little bit uh, that said uh, Spanish chords. I was wondering, was there a different musical language um, when you were writing music for that youth group? Um, yes, because I learned the Spanish chords, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, si, do, versus A, B, C, D. Uh, I mean, you could still use do, re, mi, right? But it was like the conversation around music was in Spanish all the time, so that's why I wrote that. But like a, yeah. a G chord is still a G chord on the guitar. It is, of course. <laughs> yeah. A G is a G. Anyone else? Ouch. <laughs> yes, sir. So I found it interesting, your narrative, you told the story of language and literacy development. Mm -hmm. And it started with associating Spanish language with Catholicism and your identity as uh, Cuban or Cuban-American. Mm -hmm. And my interpretation of Catholicism is that it's very um, ritualistic. Mm -hmm. And you even tied that together a little bit because as you told your story, as you moved out of the ritualistic nature of Spanish and the religious context, the movement towards more or organic speaking gave you trouble. 
But it was also interesting to hear that it required a major disruption away from what you were uh, sort of socialized into in order to get you to actually become more fluent in both speaking and literacy as you move to Miami. Because that's where, you said it yourself, things turned on its head, right? So I'm wondering how, have you reflected on the early life you had where it was very ritualistic and then the disruptive portion of your life that allowed you to progress? And do you find yourself dichotomizing how you're progressing through language and literacy as either being approaching it uh, ritualistically or in a very disruptive fashion? That's a great question. I should clarify, um, you know, now that you asked, in New Jersey, once I started school, I did have many opportunities to interact with my faith organically, but in English. So, for example, I remember my mother worked, so she would drop us off in school very early, and there was the fourth grade teacher, Mrs. Pizer, who was there from the crack of dawn. And so we would hang out with her, and she would, you know, perhaps be building a little um, shrine for the saint of the month, or, and, and we would interact with her, of course, and just have conversations around that. And just many other moments at school that provided for that type of talk. And also at home in Spanish, but what happens is that um, you know, after a while, we would just respond in English to my mother, and she would understand us, even if we were talking about religion. So it, w it really had everything to do with language. Spanish, my um, underdeveloped Spanish limited me from having more advanced uh, opportunities like that until youth group. That was the catalyst for that development. Yeah. And that's, do you think, the, because of the influence of your peers? Um, yes. Well, I mean, first I'd have to credit my mother. <laughs> um, and also because... Um, I mean, was your desire to learn because all of a sudden you were a teenager and you were at that age or you wanted friends and they were speaking then, and so you were, wanted to speak yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, definitely there was positive peer pressure. Um, it felt good also, and, and we, we did practice our faith, so it was, you know, we, we were attracted to that, but I do very much remember my first reaction. It's in Spanish? And, you know, not wanting to engage, but my mother left, and so, we, you know, we had to spend the first two hours there. But after that, we were hooked, because there were, there were people who were older than me, so, yeah. And, and they were very interesting kids and people, you know. No. Did you have a question? Uh huh. You're making me work tonight. Okay. I was just wondering. Um, it's a very. It sounds like a very inclusive, very friendly, very loving story and community. How would you compare your experience with other children or people of your age, having seen it from a totally different perspective and a different language and maybe a different community? How would you compare it? I've thought of that. <laughs> I have thought of that because, I mean, there must have been a lot of a lot of things just turned out right in that particular space, and that doesn't happen everywhere. We know we hear other stories. Um, I think part of it is the actual the priest who sponsored the group was a Cuban refugee who d didn't speak English yet. He was, you know, practically had just arrived. And so, and he was a very humble man. And um, my mother eventually became involved also in helping. And um, they were, they gave us support, but they were also hands off so that we kind of self-organized. And um, I think just a lot of good things came together. There were, um, you know, the kids who, who came from Nicaragua and Venezuela and all these places, and especially in the Nicaraguan kids, because they were also fleeing a situation similar to the Cubans at that moment. And a lot of them had a very, had been involved, some of them had been involved in Catholic schools themselves. And, and so um, they kind of clung to that 
you know, to this experience. They were all trying to make it in school, you know. They might have been at the top of their class in Nicaragua, but now they had to come here at 14, 15 at the U.S., and we know what that's like. Um, so this was a space where they got to um, be a leader, you know, and not be second fiddle to anybody. And, and in fact, the narrative of the ESL kids being the ones who struggle was kind of flipped because I was the English dominant one and I was the one who was struggling in this youth group. Um, so it just worked out well for us and I think there's a lot to learn from it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bernardo. <laughs> I wonder if you're planning to use your experience to now do research on other people that experience similar th things like you because for somebody that also come from a Latin America and learn English here and, and came here in my early teens, I can relate to that you know, we tend to see language learning as this linear thing, and I think that your research really showed the three-dimensional aspect of, you know, being bilingual and being, being culturally bilingual, and it would be fascinating if you can take that and start exploring other, other experiences because I was, when I came to the U.S., I was blown away to how much Spanish was spoken in, in Houston because I thought it was 100% English. And I was just blown away by, you know, you have a Spanish TV and Spanish radio and Spanish supermarket, and where am I, you know? So. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, in fact, I wouldn't, you know, when it's your life ex experience, you just take it for granted and you're not really looking at it as anything special or spectacular. So it was really interesting to me to study my own life and make all these discoveries. And um, I would never have known what to ask other people had I not done that because I would have continued to take it for granted. So I do plan to continue doing research in youth groups. Um, not just Catholic, but I'm interested in other, you know, groups of people as well, and what might be happening with the dynamics there with language and literacy. Um, I'd like to study, there's one youth group in Miami um, where my niece <laughs> attends, and um, she's third generation, but it also maintains, a, a bi there's a bilingualism to it, different from when I attended, but it's still there, so I'm curious to see how that's developing. Um, and there is one participant that I worked with in Michigan who was also a Cuban immigrant, and um, her mother found her a bilingual Bible at a garage sale. I didn't know that they existed, where one page was in English and one page was in Spanish. And so when I sat with her, and she's very fluent in English because she's been here since she was four, but she would still read across both to make meaning because she was afraid of losing her Spanish and she wanted to keep it. So it, it is very interesting. And also, what makes it more interesting is, first of all, that this learning is happening outside of school that it is powerful learning that's happening, um, and it's invisible to school because you know teachers are not aware of it, but also that it's a different narrative. Um, sometimes we hear that having two languages, we see it as a problem, <laughs> and really having two languages and developing them fully is really an asset and not a problem. So with that, I think it's the next person. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Perez. <laughs> Dr. Barbieri. All right, I get zero introduction. Great, thank you, Valana. <laughs> <laughs> My friend from the East Coast. You know. <laughs> right. So I'm from Massachusetts. Yay, great. All right. Okay. Um, so um, for the sake of time and, and uh, everyone wanting to go to the Astros game, I'm going to keep this uh, incredibly brief. You're welcome. So my name is Dr. Nina Barbieri. I am in the Department of Criminal Justice with Dr. Lovins. Um, and my research was actually a little bit unique in that this was contained in a classroom. Um, <clears throat> 
So prior to my, <coughs> sorry. So prior to my work in uh, going to grad school, I was a special ed instructor. And for a year, I worked in a charter high school for at-risk kids. And these were kids that were not able to uh, succeed in a traditional class setting. They had gone to school, then they'd been kicked out of everything. A lot of them were on probation. Um, so these were really students. Um, I've heard that this is the 10% of, of students in a traditional class or in a traditional um, school. There's 10% of, of students that are not going to graduate or move on. This was a, a, a high school full of, of that 10% of student. And so my working there at that school um, really allowed me to um, realize that there's a, there's a tremendous overlap between education and the criminal justice system. And so a lot of my work now, even though I'm in criminal justice, I still spend a lot of time looking at this very particular population of at-risk youth and ways that we can keep them out of involvement in the system to begin with. Uh, so, Dr. Lovins works on they're in the system, how can we sort of help them reintegrate back into society and not to recidivate? Uh, a lot of my work is, well, what are the types of things that we can do to keep them out of the system to begin with? Uh, and a lot of that really begins in education. So once an adolescent be becomes or starts becoming disengaged and detached from the school environment, they're at an increased risk for involvement in delinquency, for dropping out, and then subsequently subsequently uh, becoming an adult criminal offender. So if we can keep them attached to the school, if we can keep school a positive experience, we can really do a lot of good for these adolescents. Uh, so for a couple of years, I've been teaching this crime and delinquency class. This is not my transnational journey. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts and I moved to Texas. That is it. Um, but uh, so I was teaching a crime and delinquency class and we were working at a uh, volunteering at an after school program in the fifth ward. And in the spring, I sort of flipped this and I, and I moved it into um, a senior seminar class, which is a capstone class that criminal justice students take uh, once they're in their final hours. And, and this kind of bridges together methods and ethics and, and crim theory and policy, uh, and you kind of tie it together and focus on a specific uh, CJ issue or on a multitude of different issues. And we focused specifically on working with adolescents and at-risk youth. Um, and what I did instead was, instead of having uh, us go and visit and serve as mentors and volunteers to an agency, we brought the agency to us. And so we worked with two after-school programs, the Fifth Ward and one in the North Side. And we had them um, rally up a group of middle and high schoolers. And so they each brought a group of them and they would come to UHD every Thursday. And my class met them every Thursday and we did a variety of, of college ready activities. Um, and some fun hand, hands-on stuff, which I'll talk about. Um, but basically the idea is uh, thinking about back to some of the things that I talked about with this specific population, um, but we also know that um, there are some trends in terms of um, specifically young boys, boys of color are the least likely to graduate high school, uh, the least likely to move on to college, and the least likely to uh, successfully complete and graduate from um, a higher education. And so we were bringing them to us. Uh, we, I had to get some money to sort of help facilitate parking. So that was one thing that we did. We were able to get them parking vouchers so they can park in our um, visitors lot and then come up. Um, we did uh, a bunch of, of college readiness activities. We did we did campus tours, we brought admissions, we brought financial aid. Um, I would bring different speakers um, from different um, disciplines. Uh, so we brought Dr. Fugate from education and I think Dr. Goins came from social work, um, but we brought people from psych and from communications and all sorts of different disciplines. Um, and then we did a bunch of like fun, hands-on uh, CJ related things. And so we did a lot of fingerprinting activities. So I bought a lot of supplies um, to do fingerprinting activities, um, which 
culminated into their having to, to work a mock crime scene. So my students uh, did a mock crime scene and then the students, the, our visitor students had to come in and use all of the skills that we had been learning that semester. They had to lift for prints, they had to establish motive, um, they had to work together and we had a jury that they had to sort of uh, present their case to. Um, and then at the end of the semester, we had like a, like a luncheon, and so we had dinner, and we all sat around, and we, they had notebooks, so they were able to take notes on all the different activities that they had done, and all the different guests um, that had come to us um, throughout the course of the semester, and we were able to, to sort of talk um, about everything that we had done together as a class. Um, and it was a really, really... Um, moving and powerful experience. I have learned that one of the, the young men that came uh, is now a student at uh, Texas Southern and he is doing really, really well and he is, um, I guess, in the progress of becoming their mascot. Um, so he's doing, he's doing really, really good. And so, um, you know, I, we were told that even though he didn't end up coming to UHD, we're still the ones that helped facilitate this movement on for him to, to college. Um, so, that is in a nutshell, Volano is not here, so I don't know if I should sort of end and ask questions. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, right? We're losing people anyway. So that is what I did. Do you have any questions? I will hand out the microphone in my hand. So, yes. Uh, just, well, just, uh, I don't need the mic. Uh, my question to you is, you know, if you want to keep kids out of, uh, from ever getting into the system, why don't you bring back some type of discipline? Because I don't think that a parent should leave their kid with you and not allow you to discipline them. Because it's hard to raise a child without some type of discipline. So if you're not going to reinstitute discipline, they are going to be back in the system. You know. You so like like physical discipline, like there should be some type of discipline. I don't think you, there's no way, I know for a fact, there's no way that you can discipline a, uh, a child, bring a child up the right way without some type of discipline. There ought to be, they ought to bring back, put, put discipline back into teachers and principals' hands and stuff, and that may keep them out of your system. So, so interestingly enough, it can still happen in schools. So it is still in the Texas Education Code of Conduct that there can be physical punishment. You can also lock them up in a box, so long as that box is 50 square feet or smaller. I learned that, so that's interesting, right? Um, so you can still do those things, but I think they're all pieces of a puzzle. Um, and so I think that effective parenting is absolutely important. And effective parenting can look like different things depending on the parent and depending on the child, right? Some children need a little bit more love than others. And so effective parenting is absolutely important. Um, but s the school environment is also important. Peers are also important. They all kind of go together. Um, and I think that uh, we could do a lot to improve the overall well-being of a lot of people. I don't think my spanking kids is gonna, is gonna help. I think there needs to be more than that, but I think that we could absolutely do a lot to help parents raise their children in, in, in good environments. And that can look like a lot of different things. Are there any other questions? Oh, look at Miss Vivian. Yes. I'm Uh, youth that you were working with, was there something that, you know, that just stood out to you, like, this is very common among all these 10% that are having trouble in school? So in, in my experience when I was teaching, um, one thing that I did see a lot was a lot of them really did want an education. They really did want to come to school, but they didn't know how to succeed in school. Uh, they also didn't have the family support. And so I know that I've had students that came into my office and I, I remember vividly one was crying and said that he wanted to graduate, he wanted to go to college, but his parents didn't want him to, they needed him to work. And so there was a lot of difficulty in, in students sort of rectifying this role of who they wanted to be versus the role that their parents needed them to be. So we saw a lot of struggles of students really wanting to succeed but just not knowing how. And then they struggle and then people just 
can't see past that struggle. They can't see that, that spark in them that wants to do well. They just see the kid that's acting out. Any other questions for Dr. Barbieri? All right. Thank you, Dr. Barbieri. Now we're going to pass the baton to uh, Dr. Mitchell. So, hello. Um, my name is uh, Laura Mitchell, and I am a faculty in urban edu education. Um, my area is bilingual education, and bilingual literacy is really great to listen um, to Natasha. And when we actually interviewed her two years ago, I was like, we have to have her here because she speaks my language. She speaks everything that I love. What I'm here to talk about today is one of my loves that I do is a writer's workshop with children. And I started out as a project to do writer's workshop in the schools uh, with young children after, in an after school program. Uh, and because, as many of you probably know, um, when you're in school, teachers teach a lot about how to read how to spell, how to do math, maybe a little bit about science and social studies, but writing gets pushed to the side. And uh, it gets pushed to the side, and so they may have writing on special days, maybe a Christmas story, maybe a letter to your mother on Mother's Day, and writing just gets pushed to the side. And uh, it is one of the most important it affects the language development of our English language learners and our struggling readers and writers because of the listening and speaking. They develop well. Reading, many of them will develop, and writing is the piece that falls to the wayside in both their first and second languages. Um, so I started uh, just working with, we do, I've always done writer's workshop in the schools. Schools that do writer's workshop do really well on um, uh, the STAR test. The fourth grade writing test is one of the big, big tests that they have. And when schools have a natural process of writer's workshop starting in pre-K and K, they will do well by the time they, the kids are at fourth grade. And there's no worry about passing the test. And so um, I really wanted to see how I could take that knowledge that I have into the schools or am with my students. So I have a class, we have a bilingual literacy class of, uh, it's a language arts class, but we focus on writing. So in the class we learn the writing process, how to do writing, how to teach writing, and how to write for ourselves. Uh, in our class we focus on writing in Spanish. And then um, I looked for places that we could go and uh, practice this writing process with children. When I first started, we were going into the public school and I would, found a school after school program, but we get, kept getting pushed around with, uh, we have star practice this day, we have this at this time, and we would get pushed around with not being able to do our program. And about two years ago, I talked with one of my friends who is the director at the Wesley Community Center, and I was like, I really need a place to practice writing and to do this project. And she said, I really need someone like you to come in and do some programs in our school. So it was a perfect place for us. So I started taking my students into the Wesley Community Center. And it's uh, the, uh, just like um, Nina was talking about, it's part of our Near North Side partnerships. And so, a couple of things that makes it a really good partnership for us is that um, it meets, meets some of the qualifications of so, our social, social economic uh, needs that, uh, of the students. Our partner schools in the, the near north side uh, HISD area uh, have their children go there after school. The parents are from that area. And it really gives our students a good sense of working with, in that urban school setting. Um, so we started going in. First, we work with three and four-year-olds. And if you've ever worked with three and four-year-olds, it's quite exciting. I had forgotten how hard work it is. Eve came with me a couple of weeks ago. And 
It was very hard work, and it's about an hour worth of time <laughs> that we're doing this. We spend time with the three and four year olds doing, um, uh, letting them draw on paper and in journals, letting them draw stories, draw pictures, and tell stories. And as they're drawing the pictures, telling their stories, our teachers are capturing the stories and writing it down in dictation. And I call it language experience approach and giving them time to, the children tell their stories, then the teachers capture the words that they're saying, and then they, the kids can read their stories to them because even if they're not readers yet, they're, the teachers captured their words and they're able to read those words back. And it really creates a wonderful literacy process. The other process that it creates is that the uh, children have an opportunity to be listened to. As you know, and as many of us are with our children, uh, it is a very busy world. Get, get up in the morning, get your shoes on, come on, let's go, we gotta get to school. Uh, and then you get to school, then the teacher's running home really fast, you gotta do this, this, and this. And sometimes those little children just get ignored or not talked to or not listened to. And so when my students come in for that 30 to 40 minutes, they sit down with them and they just listen to them. And what has been happening is we've been coming in for semester after semester with different students from the university working with the same children at the daycare. And they love us coming in, knowing that someone's gonna listen to them, someone's gonna listen to their stories, look at their pictures, and help them tell their stories. And so it's really helped to develop literacy for, for the children. Um, and then on the other side of that coin is our students going in. So many of you, our professors here, uh, have been teaching our students before they come to me about literacy, how to teach reading, how to teach writing. And of course, they're not really working as much uh, with children at this time. They haven't started field work experiences. And our students are kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Oh, yeah. I, okay. I, and they're just listening to us when we teach like that. So we get out into the, the daycare, and things happen. Like the children are writing, and they write a whole string of letters together. And I, they go, my child didn't write anything today. My child didn't do anything. And I said, okay, let's look at what you have here. And all of a sudden, we're able to, to connect the literacy concepts of reading and writing that they've been learning in their classes to the actual work the children are doing. Sometimes they'll just go, oh, that's stringing letters together. Oh my gosh, that's what my professor was talking about. That's what it looks like. And so when you get those kind of connections going, it's like, yes, this is what it's worth to do. This is why it's important to go out and do this so that they're not just getting the textbook, they're not just getting a professor telling them the stories or a video showing them, they're seeing the real experience of a child taking on the literacy, literacy phenomenon that they've been learning about. The other thing that we do is we started a couple semesters ago is book club and so we're doing book club in the afternoon with the after school kids um, they are just so interesting um, i didn't think it would work but i thought i would try it and then some of my teachers were working with me my students they didn't think it would work and they thought i was crazy so we're at four o'clock in the afternoon we are um, coming in giving kids books to read telling them to sit for 10 minutes and read silently or read by themselves. And then they turn and share with a partner and then they write in a journal doing a reading response. And they come in very tired from school, especially in the spring semester. They have been doing toss pra uh, star practice all day long. And teachers have been working them. And if you hand a child a book, you think they might just throw it back at you. So I was worried about that. So we started. And I asked them what books did they want. They, we talked about Captain Underpants. We talked about um, a Dork Diaries was a big favorite. Um, so I went out and made sure I bought books that they wanted, that they wanted to read. And I had to really work hard to get to their reading levels and so that they would not be intimidated by the books. 
So within, within that time of getting the books that they wanted, books that they could read, they come in at 4 o'clock super excited to read a book and to work with us. And to me, that is just phenomenal, to have a child say, I want to read. And I want to read a book after I've been put through the ringer all day with reading, with writing, with all the kind of stuff that they've been making them do. They get to do what they want to do. They get choice in the books. They get books that are on their level. They're not told that they have to read a higher level. They're not told that they're below level. They just get to choose the books that they want. And then the one thing that we talk about all the time in our classes is that reading is a social experience. That social experience has to happen. And all of you guys know that when you're reading a book, you want to turn to your partner, you want to turn to your friend and say, oh my gosh, let me tell you what just happened in this book. And sometimes your partner will listen, sometimes they won't, whatever. But you know, in school, we tell our kids to read and be quiet. Quit talking. Why are you talking? You're supposed to be reading silently. All those kind of things we say and do as teachers, and I'm saying me, I did it too, but all they want to do is talk about what they just read. So the part about reading si quietly for a few minutes, then turning to their partner and sharing what they read is exciting to them and is something new and novel and different. And so that has become a big success at the Wesley Community Center. And uh, so I, this is a service learning com um, community engagement project funded by uh, the uh, service learning center with Dr. Gulati. Uh, she has been graciously funding this program for me for several semesters. Um, she doesn't really understand why we need so many crayons. Every semester I ask for about 12 boxes of crayons and in and, and her science mind, her, and I'm looking at Dr. Bhattacharchi because she knows her, in her science mind and in her very logical way, why would you need so many crayons and why do you need so much materials? And the reason we do is when we want to make sure the kids have their own journals at all times. So at the end of our time with them, they take those journals home. And I'm hoping they're writing more stories in their, in their journals. But we want them to have their own. But crayons, I don't know. I don't know what they do. But they disappear, they break. They may, might eat them. I don't know what they do. <laughs> but all I say is we just need crayons, markers, pens. And, and journals so that we can write and enjoy this experience, and she agrees to that. So that's where this project has been funded. It's made it a very wonderful partnership with the Wesley Community Center. We now have an MOU with them, Miranda of, of Operation, and we're creating some new projects with them too out of this uh, partnership. So it's been really wonderful. So, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Mitchell. Any questions for Dr. Mitchell? Yes, sir. Well, it's actually the logistics of the daycare and the time period we could get in in the morning to work with little kids, which made it nice because normally our, our, uh, uh, our teacher candidates don't get to work with such young kids, you know, being in the three and four versus uh, school age. And then there's the after school time that we can get in too, and they happen to be school age kids. So that's where the, it's the logistics of it. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Nice and loud. This is less of a question and more like an appreciation comment, piggybacking to why that age range. Um, I'm working with secondary. So we have 10th graders and we're getting into expository and persuasive writing. But before we even do that, we talk about their narratives, you know? And a lot of them still have comments like, oh, I don't think my story is interesting. Oh, I don't know how. So they don't have a literary confidence, you know? And when you talk about f three and four year olds, 90% of a child's self-esteem is developed before they're six years old. So building literary confidence before that time period is so critical. And now HISD is testing every year in middle school. 
So for them to build on that before they leave elementary school is like so, I just love how your program is moving into that avenue. Thank you. Hmm? Thank you. And I will say that what's interesting to me is to hear the passion of each, each person as they talk and each, each professor as they're talking about their discipline and the in interrelatedness of it, because I think what I'm hearing you say, uh, Dr. Mitchell, is that this, the young, even the young students, they, they want to be validated. They, they want to be heard. And I think that's a lot of times what leads a person to go a wrong, down a wrong path eventually, is that they're not heard. And so this is just all related. So it's just really good stuff. I really appreciate the passion with, with which you all bring to your work. Um, Dr. Bhattacharji. Hello, everybody. I'm really happy to be here and be the last because this project that I'm going to present to you hopefully will help a lot of children to be successful in the school so that they don't have to finish in the uh, jail system and they are successful. And like all of us, we are working together toward having a very society and a place for everybody where everybody's gonna be successful. And I'm always, um, since my time as a bilingual teacher, I always know that all children can learn. However, we have children that come here, they are immigrant children, that they don't have the background knowledge to go through the regular educational system where they have books who are really uh, written by the mainstream culture. So when these children try to read these books, they don't understand what they are reading. They can decode, but they don't understand because they don't have the background knowledge that we get as we belong to a specific culture. So this is the need that we are trying to address here. My students and I, and then Dr. Chan that I just saw, she left, but there is a group of people here that make possible this project. And I have been working in this project, um, I don't know how many years that so many people here at the university are helping to make it happen because like I said, this is major and I'm, in my mind it can go even bigger because it, there is a need for this kind of hmm, uh, resources in our community. So the, I'm gonna tell you a, a little bit and, about this project. So we start doing this work, when I say we, because it's a bunch of people, it's, it's a lot of people that make this happening. Um, we know that the Latinos, the Hispanic in general, uh, they are not successful as they go through the school system. So we need to increase the level of academic achievement of children in reading and writing. We also need to have books that are culturally meaningful for young bilingual children to support their literacy development. So it's at this very beginning when the children are needing this support. And I put culturally in red because that's the key component here. They can decode, but they don't understand what they are reading. So the especially the language of the school. And in the school, we have the belief because they answer our questions, we think they understand English or they understand Spanish, but they come to our uh, schools and they don't know very well Spanish and they don't know very well in English. So as we are working this, there are two classes the, that I do uh, teach. Those are the, the two classes are service learning courses and uh, the students in the PED 3314, Children's Literature in Spanish, they produce the books. The, the students in BED 4301, uh, teaching language art and reading in Spanish, both of the classes are for bilingual teachers, so they go and they use the book. Because there is another problem also, our teachers, they don't know how to use um, 
technology to deliver instruction. The other also um, problem that we have that we try to say, well, parents are gonna help at home. Well, guess what? Parents of these children, they are also are facing great challenge, not only in, in English, but also in Spanish. So we have to find ways that we can assist also our parents to support their children uh, at home. And the library that we are producing, and is, uh, the, there is the way the library, uh, the face of the page that we have for the, for the library. And really, we are producing about 30 books a semester, and it's 15 in English and 15 in Spanish. That is the PED 3314 class. And that's the face of the that's the face of the of the web page for the books. The children click and they are able to access the the book. Ah, Dr. Chan is here. There is Dr. Chan, she is helping me with the project. Okay, here do you see the children at the school and we go to Energize for Excellence Academy and we work there with Again, three and four. This this one is pre K three, so we do the 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 writing with the the children. My students learn about the student culture, and then the 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 children in the school they pick the topic for the for the book, and then my students are the writers. They their ideas, the children's idea, are changed into a story. That uh, then. We digitize them, and we do have the library. And Dr. Chen, can you show the library? So what it is, we produce videos that read to the children. And the, the reading is done in English and in Spanish. And you might say, why do you have to do it this way? Well, because you don't speak the same way as what you, the, uh, Natasha was trying to communicate. There is two different ways. You say something in English, but you don't say the same thing in Spanish in the same way, even though, and that's one of the things that also I see my students are struggling the, with the two system. And I'm talking about my students in the children's literature class. So it's really an interesting thing to see the, the whole process going and developing because my students are learning the skills that they need to be effective teachers and the children in the school are learning also to read and write and that's what they need also to be able to be successful in the school. Hopefully we will be able to see, but truly it's just to, um, the books are developed in a way that uh, is read to the child in, the, in both languages and then you only needed to click the link on the PowerPoint, I didn't. They click the link in the PowerPoint and you will get to the, to the library. Technical difficulty, well, let's go back to the PowerPoint. Oh, you have to restart it? Okay, <laughs> improvise. <laughs> that would be really good. Okay, so what we do is that um, it's, a, it's a long process really to, to produce the books and right now we have about 200 books and it's free, it's a, it's a survey from University of Houston downtown, it's free service to anybody who want to access this and it's very easy to access. You just have to Google UHD space E space library and you get to the to the library now we have the opportunity to monitor how many visit each book has and spanish is their favorite um, we know we know that the children go more to the spanish uh, books so which is a uh, really really nice my students uh, the um, we have two different sides for what we do for um, writing the books, we go to Energize for Excellence Academy. It's a low-income neighborhood in the southwest of Houston, and also for using the books, my other group, 
because, you know, as they are doing this, they are learning the skill on how to be effective teachers. So that's what we are doing now. So one uses the books and the other one, they have, they, they say, sometimes I have the same students doing both things. And this is truly very effective for them because it's like training on the job. And well, it's, uh, it's going really very well. And also have uh, teachers also uh, using the books and one thing that I'm really, really excited, we're gonna have a book exhibit in December. It's December the 3rd, and we have a major exhibit here that our dean is sponsoring, and I'm really grateful to that because we are meeting the children and families from, from the school, and they will have for our celebration on December the, the 3rd. And you are invited because this is a community celebration. Okay, well, I guess you're going to have to access it on your phone, and in fact, trust me, it's a very good resource for our community. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to try it, Bob. We're going to try it one more time. <laughs> 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 what did you, uh, uh, why did you start this? Why I started? I started because um, I, as a bilingual teacher, I knew that the student, I always say, if I use books, from their country, they can identify with those particular topics. But then, if you use books, I mean, like regular, the, the books that we have normally in the school, the children were unable to predict. So to be able to read, you have to predict. And then they couldn't do it because even for simple topic like Great Day, Great Day celebration in the Latino uh, culture is very different from birthday celebrations in the American culture. So if they read a book, they couldn't really connect and relate. So I started thinking about, and, and it was a process because what I did before, we didn't go to the school. I asked the student in the literature class to work with their family and come up with the stories that they wanted to put in the in the books and, it, and that was very successful too because I brought the whole family. I always like families to come and you know is, is be together because in the Latino community the, the sense of family is very very important. So I'm always celebrating the UBDs is a celebration and let's do this together. To the point that I have a story that the, the student, because it was a family event at the beginning, she started uh, writing and then the aunts came and the cousins, and then it was like a, a social event on the Saturday where everybody was contributing to, to the story. So that's the way I, I understood through my uh, graduate work that, that we have a problem as I went through the literature. And I that's what I do products. But it has a great potential for research. In fact, there is a professor from main campus, and she's researching the cultural component of the books. And then I hope, because we are in conversation with Natasha, she wants us to, to look at the writing of the student, our student here at the university. So there is, you can, Take a product like that, and then you can really do a lot of research. The, the, I know it's been successful because of the data at the school. I don't do research at the school, but I look at the test. When the student take the test, so how they are doing in that test also is telling us that it's very, very, uh, uh, it's very successful. That's one of the things. And I'm very grateful to Dr. Kuna Gulati and the Center for Community Engagement that is a, a funding the, the project. And to our team that is holding the exhibit. So thank you so very much.